Welcome to Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast designed to help biblical Christians witness to their Mormon friends, family, and missionaries. For more Bible-based resources, check out tilm.org. We have all kinds of resources to support you, including classes, witnessing scenarios, books, and so much more. Visit tilm.org today. Here are the side-by-side comparisons. I could see that those were identical. A few words were changed here and there, but the same overall message was identical. And it wasn't just one passage. It was passage after passage after passage that was taken from this book and that book. And when you see it black and white right in front of you, I'm like, yeah, that's it's clear that that was copied. I couldn't deny it. At that point, like I was, I knew the church was not true. Welcome to Jesus is Enough, a series where we dive deep into the transformational faith stories of ex-Mormon Christians. These are true stories of real souls whom God has rescued out of the darkness by revealing to them the biblical gospel message through his word, the message that Jesus is enough. This week on the show, we have part two of Carrie's story. Feeling invigorated by a strange but powerful church experience in Germany, Carrie begins her journey to discover the truth. Through careful, detailed research and a growing desire to learn more, Carrie notices several glaring contradictions in the Book of Mormon. As the list of questions continues to grow and more and more flaws are found, Carrie reaches a turning point in her faith journey. Now here's part two of Carrie's story of discovering that Jesus is enough. Thanks for listening. Suddenly, Carrie was on a new path that would broaden and deepen her understanding of Jesus. Based on what she heard about Jesus' true nature and mission, she immediately started to make new connections. So the next Sunday, I went to my home ward, and the Relief Society president, in her lesson, wrote on the board, this is the part that is the free gift, which is resurrection. And this is the part that you earn, which is where you will live in heaven, exaltation. And when she wrote, this is the part you earn, I just thought that that's not right. We don't earn our way to heaven, do we? <laughs> like, it just didn't seem right. It really rattled me. A message from that Easter song, not the good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus resounded in Carrie's mind. Her heart now burned with questions. She longed for God to show her what was true and what wasn't. I was a horrible journaler, but I just started to write down questions in in the journal and I didn't I didn't have answers, but I just kind of wrote it down and like left it there just so that I could process it later. But Carrie's questioning and her processing had to be put on hold as her family prepared to move back to the United States. We moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. We were only there for about 10 months, but while we were there, I got plugged into a homeschool group and everyone in the homeschool group, except for me, was a Christian. First thing they asked is, where do you go to church? And when I told them where I went to church, I could see the look on all of their faces. They're like, oh, okay. And so there was kind of a immediate distance, but they were friendly. Although she felt distant from the Christian women, how they talked about God and their connection to Him impacted Carrie. The way that they were talking was like they had a relationship, and it really made me start to think because I have the one and only true gospel, but I didn't have that. I didn't have that relationship that they're talking about, and I'd never even considered it. And so that really made me stop and think about why do they have that and I don't? Carrie eventually summoned the courage to strike up a religious conversation with one of the more outspoken homeschool moms. 
I asked her, can you tell me a little bit more about what Christians believe? Because I really didn't know. And so we had this kind of back and forth email dialogue about like faith versus works and grace. But honestly, I came away feeling like we believe the same thing, just kind of in reverse. The way that she described grace was God forgives us and we obey because we love Him. And I thought, well, I mean, that's kind of the same thing, right? We just obey first. You, you still obey, right? It's just the orders are reversed. And I didn't really think there was any real significant difference about it. I didn't really get a good grasp of what the difference was because she didn't know Mormonism well enough to, to kind of help me out and explain that. And so I kind of came away feeling like, eh, I guess we kind of believe the same thing. And it dawned on me one day for the first time in my life and I'm with these Christian women. I think that God gave me that experience to tell me that I need to reach out to them and minister to them because they have some of the truth, but they don't have all of the truth. That's why he put me here with these ladies to share the gospel with them. Carrie came up with what she thought was the perfect plan to evangelize her Christian friends. But God had other plans for her. None of them are going to believe the Book of Mormon. So I need to learn the gospel from the Bible, find the the LDS doctrines that are in the Bible, and that's how I can teach them what the church believes and help them come to faith. I picked up the Bible with an intent to find Mormon doctrine in it with the idea that I can share the Bible messages with these ladies and they're going to understand what I'm saying and I, I can teach it to them in a new way. Carrie finally got back out her journal and started to take notes on the questions that came up as she read and studied the Bible. As I'm reading the book of John, I'm reading these words that say, believe and you will be saved, believe and you will be saved. And I was like, well, that's not right. You have to have faith and repentance and baptism and all those things to be saved. You can't just believe, that's too easy. And that was the first time in my life I'd ever even contemplated the idea that belief could lead to salvation. It kind of made me nervous, it made me afraid, because I thought, that can't be right. It's so contradictory to what I've been taught. So either the church is wrong or the Bible is wrong, but if we believe the Bible, how do I reconcile the differences between the two? So that was kind of the thing that I'd write down in the back of my journal. Carrie started to compare and contrast the Bible and the Book of Mormon looking for the plain and precious truths she had been taught had been removed from the Bible. Her research led her to an uncomfortable discovery. I started searching the Book of Mormon and the Bible, and I couldn't find in either of them, like, for example, eternal families. Nothing in the Book of Mormon or the Bible about eternal families. God has a body of flesh and bones. The three degrees of glory, they're not in the Book of Mormon. Carrie's shelf started to fill as she discovered that almost every major Mormon doctrine and practice is missing from the Book of Mormon. So what are the plain and precious truths that are in the Book of Mormon that aren't in the Bible and I couldn't find them? And so all those things I wrote down in my journal and I was really starting to get nervous at this point, but I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. I was afraid to talk to my husband because if I went to him and expressed doubts, there was going to be a major rift in our relationship. Even though she knew there was much at stake, Carrie kept reading, studying, and making notes. I get to the book of Hebrews, and the very first thing I see is, long ago, God spoke to his prophets, but now he speaks through his son. And I was, what? He doesn't speak through prophets anymore? Is that what that's saying? That can't be right. He has to speak through prophets, but it, it's right there. So that was one of the things that really struck me is it, it says right here that he speaks through his son. And I, I didn't know how to reconcile that with living prophets. The other thing was the temple. So in the Bible, they, they talk about a lot of the temple 
ordinances, but the way that the temple is talked about in the Bible didn't seem to be really connected with our temple. And then there's a scripture that um, said God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's just this really strong disconnect, and I don't know how to reconcile this. Now, closely examining the items on her shelf, Carrie couldn't deal with being in the dark any longer. She was dedicated to pursuing truth, no matter where it led her. So I I just continued, you know, over the next few months, reading through the Bible, and just every time I'd have a question, I would write it down. I wasn't really coming to any conclusions. I was just kind of writing down, the Book of Mormon says this, or the Bible says this, or what about this? Joseph Smith said God was once a man, but how could God be an omnipotent, unchanging God if he was once a mere mortal? Matthew 22, 30 says that we neither marry nor are given in marriage, but we are taught that if you're single in this life, then you'll have the opportunity to be given in marriage in the next life if you live faithful. The Book of Mormon says God shall atone for the sins of the world, but As a Mormon, we don't consider Jesus God, so how does that reconcile? And how could Jesus be God if he's the literal son of God? If so, we would be a polytheistic religion. Carrie realized that her Mormon view of Jesus was too small. The Bible was telling her that he was God, the only God. Not one among many or someone she could someday become like. Now, like her shelf, Carrie's journal was filling with unanswered questions. What had begun as an evangelistic endeavor was now a search for eternal answers. One thing that was really challenging for me was the garments because they are designed for people who live in Utah, who don't have humidity, and Living in North Carolina, living in Kentucky, all these places with really humid climates, it was extremely uncomfortable. I would overheat anytime I was outside. I got heat stroke when we're out hiking. I complained to Anthony a bunch, and and at one point he said, well, just take them off. I'm like, I can't do that. I, I can't do that. He's like, why not? I really don't think that you have to wear your garments all the time, especially when it makes you so uncomfortable. But when he said that, that triggered something in me. Not only did Anthony, her priest holder and a former bishop, tell her she should take off her garments, but he also went further and encouraged Carrie to get more comfortable clothing. His additional words about the authority of the church shook her world. My husband says, why don't you buy some short shorts? I'm like, what do you mean? I cannot do that. And he's like, I don't think we have to do everything that the church says. It really shocked me that he said that. It kind of disturbed me, actually. And I tried to pry a little bit more, but he didn't want to say too much, and I didn't want to ask too much. I bought shorts, and I bought a tank top, and... And he wanted to go out to dinner, and I wore it, and I felt so uncomfortable. I felt like I was naked. Everybody's looking at me and judging me, and I don't know if I can do this. Although Carrie felt uncomfortable, she also experienced a sense of freedom. She realized there was more to removing her garments than mere physical comfort. But Carrie didn't have much time to process what this all meant. Soon, they were off to their next assignment in Japan. This move was different, however, because Carrie was looking at the Mormon church differently. I really tried to kind of shy away from a calling at this point because I was not really sure where this was going to go. They'd say things in church sometimes, and it would just kind of, it just didn't resonate. I'd hear something and think, Is that right? I don't know if that's right. At this point, I was really starting to feel uncomfortable about the things that I'd uncovered about the Bible and the disconnect between the church. The Bible has this message of love and forgiveness and mercy and grace and salvation. And it says that 
you're assured of your salvation where the church teaches that you're you're never sure not even uh, until you die your your fate is not you know sure because you could lose your way at any point if you don't endure to the end then your salvation's gone and the bible says you're saved and it's secure the things that the bible was saying seemed so hopeful and the things that i was taught seemed so hopeless And I really thought that it's either right or it's not. Like, there's got to be an answer here, and I need to figure it out. I'm not a one foot in the door, one foot out of the door kind of person. I kind of need to know, am I in or am I out? So if I'm in, then I have to wear garments. And if I am out, then I'm going to stop. Although Carrie had stopped wearing garments for practical, physical reasons, according to Mormon teaching, her decision had eternal life spiritual implications. I can't go to the temple if I don't wear garments. They ask you if you wear your garments night and day according to the guidelines, and I can't lie about that. So is it worth it to me to not wear the garments and to not go to the temple? If you can't go to the temple, then you're not an eternal family. Could I leave the temple? even though her prior experience at the temple had been so negative. Because the temple was emphasized so much for life and eternity, Carrie determined to give the temple one last try. I had two friends that wanted to go on a temple trip, and I went with them. And the whole time, I just felt so uncomfortable. I really wanted to have a good spiritual connection. I want it to be a good experience. And instead I sat there and thought, why am I here? Why am I doing this? The celestial room, thoughts popped into my mind. Why are we making promises to remain sexually pure and to give our time, talents, and money? We're making that covenant in behalf of people who are dead. They don't have time anymore. They don't have money. They don't have talents. They're certainly not having sexual relations. So why are we making these promises if they're dead? When the women left the temple, Carrie's thoughts turned to a connection she heard about Mormons and Masonic symbols and rituals. When she arrived home, she was still thinking about Masons and Mormon temples. I've been to Nauvoo several times. I'd seen the sunstones. And my husband had talked about the Masonic connection. I didn't really know what it meant, and I I didn't really care what it meant at the time. But so now I I Google Mormons and Masons, and the first thing that pops up is this matrix. This is the Mormon temple ceremony. This is the Masonic ceremony. This is the signs and the symbols and the clothing and the words. And they changed a few things to make it more religious, but they had, the Masons had the entire temple ceremony. Carrie started making all sorts of connections, and additional questions popped up in her mind. If this is what we have to know to get to heaven, to be exalted with God, and the Masons have that, couldn't God come up with his own system? He had to take it from them. And so I think that was like the final door closing for me. The temple was what I was hanging and hinging all of my faith on, like, I can't deny the temple. And then to find out that it's it was copied from, from somebody else. I felt like someone had punched me in the stomach. I felt physically sick. So that was kind of the turning point. Carrie's overloaded shelf was now cracked and just about to break. And she was ready to break it. She turned her attention back to the Book of Mormon and the Mormon church itself. I said, okay, I need to know how do Christians disprove the Book of Mormon and how did they disprove the church? I kind of already disproved the temple in my own mind, but if the Book of Mormon falls, everything else falls. So I'm like, okay, how do they prove the Book of Mormon is not true? And that was the first time that I actually went onto Google and looked up information that might be considered anti-Mormon. It was really, really hard for me to do that first Google search. I was literally shaking because 
It was a sin for me to look up anything that was not official church doctrine on the website. I needed to know what the truth was. And it took five minutes. It took five minutes for me to be convinced that the Book of Mormon was not true. One particular resource Carrie found that day was called A Letter for My Wife. It helped her process many of her most important questions and concerns. It was a guy who had left the church, wrote this letter to his wife and said, these are the reasons why I'm leaving the church. And it was an article that was, again, side-by-side -side comparisons of things. The first thing that struck me was the, the plagiarism claims. He had, you know, this is this book, this is the Book of Mormon. Here are the side-by-side -side comparisons. I could see that those were identical. A few words were changed here and there, but the same overall message was identical. And it wasn't just one passage, it was passage after passage after passage that was taken from this book and that book. And when you see it black and white right in front of you, I'm like, yeah, that's it's clear that that was copied. I couldn't deny it. At that point, like I was, I knew the church was not true. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Jesus is Enough. To watch the video version of this episode or to support this project, please visit tilm.org slash radio. Next time on Jesus is Enough, Carrie makes a big decision regarding the future of her faith and her family. Will her husband be receptive to what she has to say? What will happen if he chooses the Mormon faith over her? Will she finally find the peace she has been seeking all along? Find out next week on Jesus is Enough. Jesus is Enough is presented by Truth and Love Ministry and is a production of Goldwing Productions. Truth and Love Ministry, based in Nampa, Idaho, is a Christian ministry devoted to proclaiming Christ to Mormons and empowering Christians to witness. In addition to offering time-tested training, it provides ongoing support. This includes person-to-person -person mentoring as well as websites with pages of practical tips, strategies, and witness stories. In addition to Jesus is Enough, it also produces the Witnessing Christ podcast. To learn more and lend your support, please visit tilm.org. Jesus is Enough is produced and written by Mark Parsons with writing assistance from Molly Parsons. It is produced and edited by Brian Urbanek, with editing assistance from Josh Cappers. The show was adapted for this format by Megan Nishas. You can learn more about Jesus is Enough at JesusIsEnough.org. Until next week, remember, keep planting those gospel seeds, trusting in the power of God's word. Hi, this is Molly and Mark from the Jesus is Enough ministry team. Mark, Mormonism falls apart for Carrie in this episode. How does the witnessing Christian gently handle facts that disprove Mormonism or the anti-Mormon material? I think the word you used, gently, is a good one to keep in mind. As a, a Christian witness, we might get very excited if a Mormon encounters anti-Mormon materials that start to make their shelf crumble. But one of the things that I always want to be very cognizant of is I don't want the very foundation of a Mormon's worldview to completely crumble until I have had opportunity to rebuild a foundation on the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is not our goal just to get someone out of Mormonism. Our goal is to lead them to Jesus and into a trusting relationship with him. There is a difference between just falling and falling into the arms of Christ. Oh, that's beautiful. Carrie mentions some friends in her homeschool group. These Christians teach her about a relationship with God, and she wonders, what is a relationship with God, and why don't I have that? How would you explain it to a Latter-day Saint? Most of the time when Mormons think of their relationship with Jesus, it is very much transactional in nature. 
I do this for Jesus and then he will do this for me. He will do some things for me. I will do some things for him. But what Carrie noticed is that they had a trusting relationship with Jesus that was based on the completed work of Christ for them. And so that's one of the things to emphasize when we talk about relationship. It's not about knowing or doing or even saying the right things as much as it is of simply trusting that Jesus came and lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death for the world, but also for me personally. It reminds me a bit of the thief on the cross. He didn't do ordinance and covenants and any works because his time was up, but he knew Jesus. Carrie is getting to know Jesus through the Bible, and she says, the Bible is full of hope. Friends, keep sharing that hope that you have in Christ. Yep. Point them to Jesus. Build their lives anew on his firm foundation. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Molly. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a Truth in Love ministry podcast. For more resources, visit TILM.org. If this podcast and other Truth in Love ministry resources have been a blessing to you, consider supporting the mission to proclaim Christ to Mormons and empower Christians to witness by visiting TILM.org backslash 